Okay, so welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce today uh, Kaso Okuju, who will speak to us on the HRT conjecture. Kaso. Thank you very much, Irina, and thank you, Peta, for the invitation. Um, so I would like to talk about uh, a very interesting project to, to myself and uh, uh, a problem that I find quite uh, addictive, uh, and uh, I hope uh, it generates some conversation, and hopefully if uh, anyone sort of had some interest in, in looking into this, that will be uh, very good. So uh, it's called the HRT conjecture, and uh, the plan is, uh, uh, I'll first tell you what the conjecture means, and uh, I'll try to summarize what's known about the conjecture uh, in, since like it was posed like uh, about a little bit over 20 years ago. And uh, I'll uh, try to explain like uh, an idea that I started off uh, playing around, uh, play with a couple of years ago and uh, uh, show you essentially what, what I've been able to achieve with, uh, with that, uh, that, uh, that set of ideas. And uh, finally show you on some concrete example, like uh, the result of uh, that sort of uh, set of uh, ideas. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, a lot of uh, interesting and open question as well. All right, so let's begin by stating exactly what the HRT conjecture is. So it was a conjecture that was first proposed by Chris Hyde, uh, Jay Ravanathan and uh, Prakash Topiwala in 1996. So HRT come from the name. And the conjecture asks the following question. So suppose I give you a function f, or uh, a function g, uh, which is a square integral, integrable function. You can even assume that the function is very nice, like uh, the Schwarz function. And uh, give yourself also uh, a set of uh, point a, k, b, k in two dimensions. So you have n distant point in R2. And you look at the collection of time and frequency shift of this function g along with point a k b k. So in other words, I'll shift my function in space by a k, and I'll modulate the function in frequency by the number b k. And the question is whether the resulting set of uh, n vector in L two of R is uh, linearly independent. So to be more specific, uh, if you give me like uh, n uh, coefficient so that uh, this linear combination is equal to zero almost everywhere. Can I conclude that uh, the number CK are all zero? So that's that is essentially the HRT conjecture. So uh, there are two basic data in this, uh, in this uh, statement. Uh, there is a function G and here I'm going to stick most of the time to the case where the function is quite integrable. But it's a very sort of surprising that uh, even if I had assumed like a lot of smoothness about my function and also a lot of decay, uh, I still don't know if in general, uh, this n function are linearly independent in, uh, in L2 of R. Uh, you can state the conjecture uh, of, you can ask the same question in, uh, in higher dimension, but uh, here I'm just going to stick to, to the case of a function defined on the real line and uh, where the point AK and BK are in, uh, in two dimensions. So that's, uh, that's the HRT conjecture. So uh, I want to get rid of one simple case right away. And uh, the case is uh, when all the points are exactly on the same line. So you can sort of see that that's exactly the case that you can deal with with uh, Fourier analysis. In that case, uh, a linear dependence relation can be transferred into the Fourier domain. And from there, you can sort of essentially get uh, the result that they have to be linearly dependent. So if all the points are sitting on a, on, a, on a single line, then it's known that uh, this has to be linearly independent. And this theorem or this result actually predates uh, the HRT conjecture. It was a result that was obtained by Edgar and Rosenblatt uh, in 1980. They've done this not only in one dimension, but they've done it in a high dimension. Uh, they, I believe gave like a, a pretty complete accurate picture of what happened in RD in terms of the linear independence uh, in the space of LP of RD. And I believe they even sort of uh, have like some results uh, on groups uh, uh, along the same flavor. So translation of function on group and uh, de deciding whether or not the set of function that one obtained is linearly independent in LP of uh, on, the, on those groups. 
So here, uh, I'm most of the time going to not work in this case because that's uh, the case that's well known. So I'm going to look at different configuration in general and determine whether or not uh, the conjecture is true. So for, for just the fun of a talk, and uh, if you feel like you want to sort of play a little bit uh, with uh, some concrete example, uh, I have over here um, a number of uh, three different examples, and uh, you can take your favorite function um, and play or think about how you might want to decide whether or not these functions are linearly independent. So I'm going to I'm going to draw this on on, on a graph just to give you a, a sense of uh, what I'm doing. So the first example will be in blue. So I'm choosing four different points in the plane. So I'm choosing the origin. I'm cho choosing the point zero one. I'm choosing the point one one. And then I'm choosing square root of two one. So that's the first one. Uh, so that uh, the example for G one. And then G two, um, let's change the color for G two. I do the same thing, except that uh, I take zero one, one zero, uh, zero, zero. And then I take square root of two, square root of two. So something like this, this is square root of two and this is square root of two as well. So that's the second example. So I take these four points, I look at the translation in time and the modulation in frequency by this uh, four different point of a function G in L2 or even a Schwarz function. And I want to decide if a set of functions, this set of four functions are linearly independent. And then the last example is, uh, let's change uh, the color, I use green. Um, and in this case, I'll choose this, this, uh, this. So I have the origin. And then I have a uh, square root of three and pi. So pi, uh, let's pretend that pi is somewhere here. And this is square root of two. So the point will be somewhere here. So I have four different points and uh, you pick your favorite function and then you ask yourself whether or not this set of functions uh, are linearly independent. So I'll just give you a minute if you want to sort of uh, put this down somewhere. Uh, and then toward the end of the talk, I'll come back to this example and tell you what's known. But in general, uh, this is uh, this set of four points is still not completely known uh, what happened for the, for the conjecture. All right. So, uh, before I get too far, I want to sort of uh, highlight a little bit uh, why the HRT conjecture, where do we get this conjecture from? So uh, um, the conjecture arises uh, in the setting of time frequency analysis. And uh, in, term, in, in time frequency analysis for me here uh, will mean something that sort of uh, originated from Dennis Darbo work. And uh, one can sort of think about it as also like uh, coming from a question that John von Neumann uh, asked uh, uh, in 1932 and that Dennis Garbo also asked uh, uh, about a decade later. So the question that they ask is the following. So suppose that G is a Gaussian and look at the time and the frequency shift. So this is exactly the same sort of uh, function that I gave you a little bit earlier. But here I'm actually um, uh, shifting only on the integer lattice in both time and frequency. And the question that John von Neumann asked was whether or not this spent a denser space of L2 of R. And uh, Garbo actually went a little bit further in, uh, in this by asking whether or not it's possible to give an expansion for any square integrable function in terms of this time frequency shift of the Gaussian. So clearly these two questions are somehow related. And it turned out that the answer for both questions is yes. And this was settled independently by two group of people, Bagman, Butera, uh, Gilardo, and Clouder in 71, and independently by Perry Lobov in 71 as well. So they proved that this set of uh, function, the Gaussian, and when you uh, shift it and uh, modulate it along the integral lattice, this form uh, uh, a denser space of H of R. Now, this, one, this question doesn't really have to do with uh, the question that I was uh, asking earlier, but the problem about the HRT conjecture came actually in the study of the system that are now known as Garbo system. So a Garbo system is a system, a set of function that's obtained by taking a time frequency shift of a given function in L2 of R, where you take your, uh, your, your time and frequency shift to be like uh, just any discrete set in, uh, in, in the plane. So the, the 
HRT conjecture is concerned with exactly finitely many time frequency shift of a given function. And uh, in general, I could consider like uh, a countable set and I can try to understand the approximation property of uh, this set of points, of this set of function. So this kind of system are known as a wild Heisenberg or Darbo system. Uh, they are example of coherent state and uh, another very well-known example of coherent state are the wavelet system. And uh, in terms of wavelet, uh, we know that in order to construct a wavelet, we usually start from uh, something called like the scaling equation. And uh, the scaling equation is uh, a representation of a given function uh, at two different scales. So if we think about the half scaling function, which is a uh, of the characteristic function of zero one, then we can write that with, uh, the characteristic function of zero one is a sum of uh, a scale and translate version of it itself at scale two, which is to say that g of x is equal to g of two x plus g of two x minus one. So what this is saying is saying that if instead of taking modulation, I look at translation and dilation by two or powers of two, then I just construct here a non-zero L2 function that give me a system that's linearly dependent. So in other words, if I change the modulation operator B and BK, if instead of that, I use like dilation by powers of two and I use translation by some integer, what I've sort of discovered is that there are function, at least I gave you one example here, there exists a non-zero L2 function so that a finite, a finite set of uh, uh, um, time shift and the dilation of a single function is linearly dependent. So if a question that I was going to ask about the HRT conjecture, if I change one of the operator to become the dilation, then this is uh, something that's completely known. And this, uh, the half function is not the only one that you can use. Uh, there are plenty, uh, plenty of function that you can use. So if you uh, know anything about wavelet, then all the wavelet that are obtained by, from the multi-resolution analysis framework uh, the, the sort of uh, the starting point is an equation of this type that tells you that your function is uh, a linear combination of itself at the next scale. And then from there, you have plenty of functions. So all the Dobeshi scaling functions are essentially like example of function that will give you linearly dependent set. But here, there's a big difference. I'm changing with one of the operator while I'm keeping with translation, I'm changing the modulation operator to a dilation operator. So as far as I know, uh, uh, the HRT conjecture uh, came about because uh, in the 90s, uh, people were trying to understand the distinction of the parallel between the theory of wavelet and uh, the theory of Garbo system. And uh, it was, in my knowledge, based on the fact that uh, wavelet are sort of obtained through this two-scale equation, that Chris Hai, J. Ramanathan, and uh, Prakash Topiwala actually uh, start sort of uh, checking whether or not uh, one could get a similar statement when one replaced the dilations by the modulation. And uh, soon enough, they discovered that this problem is quite different from the one where you have a wavelet. And uh, since then, the HRT conjecture has sort of been sort of uh, paused, but uh, not much has sort of been sort of made as uh, progress in resolving it. Uh, there is one aspect of the HRT conjecture that uh, uh, I know just a little bit about, but uh, that I'm not going to focus on, which is, uh, there is uh, this statement of this conjecture in algebra that's called the zero divisor conjecture. And uh, it seems like uh, the HRT conjecture can be thought of as uh, a statement about the zero divisor, uh, divisor conjecture, but for the Heisenberg group. But this is an approach that I'm not going to look at uh, at all. I want to sort of focus more on the analytical approach to the HRT conjecture. So this is uh, essentially the history of the HRT conjecture. And now what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about what's known about this, this problem. So please stop me if you have, if you have any question, okay? So, all right, so, uh, the very first thing that I want you to observe is that uh, there, was, uh, there was something uh, in all the examples that I gave you. Uh, you could see that I have always the point zero zero, the point one zero, and the point uh, zero one. And then I just vary the last three points. So in one case, it was on the x axis as well. On the other case, it was not, but uh, it's sort of uh, sitting somehow like uh, 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 off, the, off the line. 
And then the last one is also like off the line. But the key point that I want to sort of draw your attention to is that all the three examples have exactly uh, three points that are sort of common. And this is not like an accident. In fact, uh, uh, it's not too difficult to see that if you have like uh, at least three points in your set of points for which you want to check the HRT conjecture, then by using a shift, you can always assume that the one of the point is zero, zero. So you, you move everything by a time frequency shift of one of your points. So what's going to happen is that all your over points are going to be shifted of uh, translation by, uh, by whatever you use, but then it's going to affect your function G in the sense that your function G will become like uh, a new function. And that new function is just a function that unitarily equivalent to your original function G. So by shifting the whole system, I will not change the problem. So I will always do that. And that will result in me assuming that zero, zero is always a point in my set. The second thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to use rotation and I'm going to rotate so that one of the uh, point fall on the Y axis. And uh, I can always do that. Uh, and then I'm going to scale uh, and use essentially a shear matrix to sort of make sure that the point that on the, on the Y axis uh, is exactly at zero one. And then the point that on the X axis, I can put it anywhere on any position on the X axis. So that's going to result into the third point being a zero. So when I have exactly three points, then I can always assume without loss of generality that the three points are given by zero, 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 one, or a zero, where a is uh, non-zero. And if I have more points, then I'm going to always assume that my set of points contain a point of this form. Now, the, four, uh, the three examples that I gave earlier, I made the extra assumption that the point that's of the other point on the x-axis uh, I just scale it to be equal to one, but this is not like something that I could do in, in great generality. In great generality, the only thing that I know I can do is to make sure that uh, one of the point is at the origin, the other one is either one of the first or one of the uh, unit uh, vectors, and then the other one will be either on the y-axis or on the x-axis anywhere. So I'm going to make that simplification uh, when through the talk. And uh, in particular, if I have a set of three points, I'm always going to assume that it has uh, the given form that's the given over here. All right, so what's known about the HRT? So the conjecture has been around since uh, 1990 and uh, the known result fall into two categories. So there is uh, the category for which you assume that you want to prove the strongest possible result by taking your G to be an arbitrary L2 function but then you restrict to your set of points. You want to look at special points for which you can prove the best result you can for uh, G in L2 of R. And then you can flip this around by assuming that the set of points can be any subset of uh, finite subset of R2, but then you want to use like some special class of uh, L2 function. And then other results include like um, uh, a combination of these two. Uh, so you take special function and then you look at special configuration. Uh, there are some permute, uh, permute, uh, perturbation argument that you can use as well. So if you assume that uh, the HRT is true for a function G, then you can probably show that it has to be true for function that are close enough to G. Uh, on the other hand, if you know that it's true for a given function G and a given set of points, then it is not too difficult to prove that uh, you can actually wiggle a little bit those points to show that uh, the conjecture will remain true in the neighborhood of, of those points. And then there is a spectral version of the HRT conjecture, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today. So to, to give you some sort of uh, better idea, I want to sort of highlight some of these known results. And uh, I'll give a few examples in, um, in each category. So the first proposition is uh, a sample of result uh, that uh, assume that I'm taking any arbitrarily non-zero L2 function. Uh, when the points are on the same line, I already mentioned that this is of a sort of easy case because it completely fall on, uh, on um, Fourier analysis. Uh, and uh, this was settled already by Edgar and Rosenblatt even before the HRT was, uh, was paused. Uh, the, next point, the next one is actually a very interesting case, which is almost a modification of uh, the first one. So in this case, um, so I'll try to draw a picture of this situation over here. Um, 
So the second example here is that I have all the points are sitting on the same line. So if I assume that my first point is here, but I want something very important. I want all the points that are sitting on the same line to be equal distance to each other. So by using the scaling and the rotation that I just sort of uh, said or uh, talked about earlier, I can just assume that the points are sitting like, uh, oh no, the integers, one, two, three, and so forth. And then the third point or the last point will just be any point of this line. And by using a shear matrix, I can ensure that this point is anywhere on the y axis. So here I'm taking n point that are n minus one point, sorry, that are on the same line and that are equispaced. And then I'm picking the last point, the end point to be any point of this line. And this case is also uh, a case that you can settle by, uh, by Fourier analysis more or less. And uh, this was already proved in the, in the original paper by Hai, Ramanathan, and Topiwala. Uh, the best uh, or most one. generic, yep. Uh, one quick question. Uh, why can you assume that they are integers exactly? I, I, I thought you have one, uh, why, why you can assume that they are integers? No, so I can, I can, so what I said is I can assume that the point or the point are equispace, right? So it's going to be A, 2A and 3A and so forth. Ah, okay, okay. If they are equispace, then, then yes. Okay, yes, I agree. So that's what I meant here. I said the point are equispace. On the line. Okay, I, I did not see that word. Thank you. Yes, thank you. yes, thank you. So again, this one fall into Fourier analysis and uh, they prove it already in the original paper. Now, the, the most general results that work in any dimension is actually the, the third one here, which is due to uh, Linnell. This is probably the most general result that known in any dimension. It says that if you take your, uh, your, sub, uh, your set of points, to be any subset of a lattice in any dimension, then the HRT is true and this is independent of, uh, of dimension. So this could, I could have stated this for L2 of RD and uh, this is true in general. So any three points always sit on a lattice. So this was already observed by uh, High Ramanathan and Topiwala. So they proved uh, the case for three points already in the original paper. And the case of three point is actually just a special case of this case that I just highlighted here because in three case, I can assume that this is zero, this is one, and then the, the last one will be just anything of the line. So that was, uh, that, that was uh, proved already in the original paper. But again, uh, this proof right here is actually the most general that you can think of. Uh, he proved it, Linnell proved this result using uh, some von Neumann algebra technique. And uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I think uh, Demeter proved like uh, a special case of this lattice case using a completely different sort of set of notion which are related to uh, almost mafia operators. Uh, the second set of results, so this is not like the complete set, but I'm just trying to give you like uh, an idea of the main one that I can think of. And the second set of results is that I want to assume that the set lambda is arbitrary. And so I take any finite subset of uh, R2 and I want to impose condition on the function so that the HRT conjecture is true. So the first one was already again in the paper by Hai, Ramanathan and Topiwala, where they proved that if a function G is compactly supported, then you can prove that the HRT is true. Uh, that's not too difficult to see. You just write down the equation and then you shift it enough. And then you're going to realize that all the coefficient in your linear dependency relation must be equal to zero. Uh, the other one follow essentially the same sort of same argument, which is if you take like uh, any Hermit polynomial, so in particular, if you take the Gaussian, then you can prove that the HRT conjecture is true no matter uh, the finite subset of uh, point in, uh, in R2 that you sort of take. And uh, since then, people have been playing uh, with uh, some sort of decay condition on the function that's going to guarantee that uh, the HRT conjecture is true. And uh, one of the best results along those lines is a result by Bornick and uh, Spiegel. And uh, they show that if you have like um, a little bit less on uh, like uh, a decay like a Gaussian, then you can still sort of prove that the HRT is true essentially for any arbitrary set of points in two dimensions. Uh, they, they extend these results to some special case of uh, set in, uh, in dimension D as well. 
And so this is also a very interesting sort of uh, result that sort of uh, use essentially the decay condition on G to actually get something about the HRT condition. So uh, if I have to be very general, this is essentially what's known. Uh, there are now some sort of a combination um, and uh, I'm just listing a few of them here and uh, I'm not going to sort of worry about too much um, trying to explain any of these except the very last two. And uh, those are the one that I want actually to sort of spend my time uh, talking about today. So uh, I've just said a minute ago that the HRT conjecture has been settled for any three points in two dimension. And so the next natural case that you'll think about is uh, the set of four points. And uh, Dimitri and Zararescu uh, proved that when the four points uh, sit on a special configuration, I'm going to draw it in a minute, then the HRT conjecture is true for any L2 function. And uh, they look at a different configuration. Uh, Dimitri by himself just uh, look at a different configuration of four point uh, that's called one free configuration. And he proved that if the window is uh, restricted to be a Schwartz function, then uh, the HRT conjecture is true. So what I want to do is to sort of give a definition or at least a picture of what these two two and uh, this uh, one free configuration is. But before I do that, I want to just give you a flavor of uh, at least the most, the way I know how to prove the HRT for most of the case that I, I sort of know. And uh, all the argument that I know somehow are variation of this one. And I just want to put it here to give you some sort of uh, flavor on what's going on here. So if you only have three points, okay? And uh, you assume that the system was linearly independent. So this is the proof for the HRT for three points then just write the dependence relation that you get. So you can write that G of X minus A is a polynomial. It's um, 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 a trigonometric polynomial multiplied by a function G. And now what you do is you iterate this relation to minus infinity and to plus infinity essentially. And um, you sort of uh, somehow prove that this cannot sort of be the case uh, these two things cannot sort of happen at the same time because you know that because the function is in L2, you know that it has to sort of decay somehow at infinity. And uh, you somehow relate the polynomial or the product of polynomial that sort of involved in your iteration. And you show that uh, uh, both of these quantity cannot be going to zero. And on one hand, if A is a rational number, there is a, a periodicity argument that you can use in order to sort of make this conclusion. And uh, if A is irrational, usually people appeal to the ergotic theorem in order to sort of get the result. So most of the proof that I know use a variation of this argument in general. I'm not going to go into the completely technical detail, but uh, that's sort of uh, a picture I want you to sort of keep, uh, keep in your mind. The only thing that I need to sort of, uh, the only disclaimer that I need to sort of make is that the proof that I sort of uh, mentioned by Linnell of the HRT conjecture for, for lattices, that will prove that completely different from this one and that used uh, von Neumann algebra. And uh, that has sort of not been sort of uh, replicated in any of the other situations that uh, have been looked at so far. So what I would like to do is to focus essentially for a few minutes on the four case or four point case. So we know that is true for any three point. And we want to sort of see what's happened for four point. I mentioned a few things uh, uh, on the previous slide. And I want to sort of just sort of uh, write down a summary of uh, what's known for four point. Now I have to define what a two two configuration is. So it simply means the following. So a two two configuration is just saying that you remember one point should always be at the origin. The other point can be like one zero and the other point can be anywhere on the y-axis. So any three point will be there. So if I have a two-two configuration, all it means, it means that the four point should be on either this line or on this line. In other words, I want two of my points to sit on a line and the other two to sit on a parallel line. That's what a two-two configuration is. So this will be an example of a two-two configuration. For instance, if it was here, then my four point will be this, 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 and this one. So two of them are sitting on the line and the other two are sitting on a parallel line. That's what a two-two configuration is. Uh, and then a one-three configuration. So this is an example of a two-two configuration. 
a one three configuration is exactly the one that I mentioned earlier. So you have three points on one line and then one point of the line. So I can be in this situation. Now, if you follow correctly, and I think Pata asked me a question earlier, the conjecture is known if the three points that are sitting on the same line are exactly equidistant to each other. So if it was one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, or zero, one, two, sorry. If it was zero, one, two, one, two, then whenever my other three point, third, uh, fourth point lie, I know that the HRP conjecture is true. So a one three configuration, a general one three configuration is that the three point on the line are not equispaced and then the fourth point is just any other point in the plane. I can, by doing uh, a shear, I can assume that the fourth point is on the Y axis. So this is the, uh, the case that I was mentioning earlier. And if you sort of keep that in mind, then I know that if I have a two two configuration, uh, Demeter and Zarescu prove that yes, the HRT conjecture is true for any L2 function. Uh, along the, uh, around the same time, Demeter proved that if instead you assume that the function is a Schwarz class, then it's true for all one three configuration. And uh, Leo in um, um, early this year or late last year proved that uh, in fact, uh, if you pick your function in L2, then for almost all one three configuration, and almost here is in the sense of uh, Lebesgue measure. So for almost every one three configuration, the HRT conjecture is true. So I can remove like uh, the condition that the function is very smooth by replacing it. Uh, can you see, or uh, my screen is frozen? It looks like my screen is frozen. Give me just a minute. Okay. So if you, you can sort of remove a condition that the function is a Schwarz function by allowing G to be in L2, but you have to allow for maybe a bad class of one three configuration for which you might not be able to, co to conclude. So these are the general results that are known and uh, beyond that, nothing is known for, for, for four points. So what I would like to suggest here is uh, a slightly different approach that's going to look at like one end configuration in general. So one three configuration is just a special case of where I have all my points on one line, except one that's going to be of the line. And I'm not going to assume anything about the distribution of distance between the point on the same line. So to give you sort of a flavor of what I'm going to do, I'm going to sort of play a very simple game that's sort of going to serve as a motivation to of the definition that I'm about to make and to the theorem that I'm about to state. So suppose uh, I'm working with a one three configuration. So I'm looking at a one three configuration. So suppose you have this point. Uh, remember, I can always put one here and then I don't care about what this is. So this is going to be A and this is going to be B. So suppose for a moment that uh, uh, there, was, there was an L2 function for which this system will be linearly dependent. So if it was linearly dependent, then I can write the translation by B of G, which is going to be G of X minus B. I can write it as a C1 multiplied by G plus C2 multiplied by the translation by A plus C3 multiplied by the modulation. I'm just going to be M1 of G, okay. So if G is real value, so this is a big if is real value. Then if I take the complex conjugate of the equation, then I'm going to have TG is going to be equal to also equal to C1 bar G plus C2 bar TAG plus C3 bar M minus one G. Now, if you sort of uh, take the two together and uh, sort of subtract them, then you're going to end up with C1 minus C1 bar multiplied by G plus C2 minus C2 bar multiplied by G or TA, sorry, TAG. Now plus C3, M1 of G. When you take the conjugate of this one, you're going to have minus C3 bar M negative one of G will be equal to zero. Now, let me draw what that means in terms of, of the picture. If I change it, what I've done is 
I've essentially removed this point. And by taking the symmetrized version, I put the point minus one here. Now, if the function was real value, then I'm clearly going to get a contradiction here, right? Because these three points are equispace uh, on the same line, and the point A is of that line. And this relation cannot hold unless all the coefficients are equal to zero. So what this is sort of showing is I'm trying to prove the HRT conjecture for one particular, uh, uh, for a general one three configuration. And I've reduced it, at least when the function is real value, I've reduced it to a case that I know how to solve. So what I would like to sort of uh, take the last few minutes of my presentation to discuss is, is there a possibility to actually do this in a more systematic way where I want to prove the HRT conjecture for a given configuration and I'll try to relate that configuration to the one that I know very well how to deal with. So uh, to give you uh, a better sort of motivation, uh, I can state the following result that sort of uh, tell you something about not just like one three configuration, but uh, all the one n configuration or one n minus one configuration. So the statement of the result is the following. Suppose that n is greater or equal to three and g is uh, a function in L2. And suppose that I know for some reason that the HRT conjecture is true for all one n minus one configuration. So for this function G, no matter what one N minus one configuration you give me, suppose that I know that the HRT conjecture is true. Then what I can prove is that there exists at most one equivalence class of one N configuration. Let's call that uh, gamma zero so that uh, the HRT conjecture might fail for that configuration. So what I want you to do is to compare this with the result that I state over here, which says that the HRT conjecture is true for almost all one three configuration. What I'm saying here almost is that uh, there exists exactly one such bad case of uh, the set. Uh, I, I don't have a proof of the statement that I'm making, but the way I want to interpret these two results together is that uh, the bad of a set of measure zero, that's bad, is essentially just this single equivalent class that I'm describing here. And the example of a motivating example that I just gave you shows the following corollary, that if you assume that the function is real value, then the HRT conjecture is actually true for all one three configuration. So there exists no bad configure, one three configuration if you allow your function to be real value. And the proof is essentially in the picture that I just drew here. If that was the case, you can sort of get back to the case that you already know, the HRT conjecture is true. So this is the idea that I want to try to generalize. I want to sort of be able to go back from known case to case that are not known and vice versa. And the way I would like to do it is somehow to extend the HRT conjecture one point at a time. So uh, I would like to sort of uh, suggest the following approach for the HRT conjecture. So suppose that uh, you know that the HRT conjecture is true for a set of endpoints. So I give you endpoints and you know that the HRT conjecture is true for those endpoints. And I want to add one extra point and I want you to tell me whether or not the HRT conjecture is true for this new set of n plus one point, exactly the same function G. And in order to look at this, what I want to do is to look at the Gramian of a system generated by this function. So what the Gramian of the system is just the matrix, the square matrix n plus one by n plus one matrix that you obtain by taking the inner product of all the function in your system here. So you can break this into, uh, into a, block, um, uh, a block matrix where the upper left corner is a Gramian that corresponds to the system that you know already is linearly independent. So remember, my assumption is that for the first endpoint in my system, I know that the HRT conjecture is true. So if I look at that Gramian, I know that in terms of Gramian, that just means that this matrix is a positive definite matrix because by definition, the Gramian is always positive semi-definite. So here, what I'm sort of making is that, okay, suppose that this upper uh, left corner is positive uh, definite and I consider this entire new matrix, which is a block, and I would like to decide whether or not the HRT conjecture is true. So to make that determination, all you have to do is to prove that this matrix doesn't have like uh, an eigenvalue of zero. 
so that all the eigenvalue of this matrix are strictly positive. I know by definition that they are non-negative. I just want to prove that the smallest one is also strictly positive. And uh, by using this approach, actually, I can recover the proof of the uh, HRT conjecture for collinear, uh, collinear points. So if all the points were on the, on the same line, you can actually just easily prove that uh, you get the HRT conjecture. This is a completely different proof. And it's just based on analyzing this matrix and realizing that using uh, Buckner theorem, that this matrix is indeed positive uh, definite and therefore the HRT conjecture, which we already know in this case. So this is not a new information, but it's just a way to sort of show that this approach can actually give you one of the known results about the HRT. So what I want to do now is to sort of uh, look at uh, a few cases that I can handle. But before that, I want to understand a little bit more uh, how to interpret uh, the positive definiteness of this matrix. So uh, you can define a function f of a, b, that's a function of a new point that you want to test. And that function is uh, g minus one of u of a, b, u of a, b. Now I'm not telling you what this vector is. It's just a vector that encodes the information about the new point that you're trying to test and the function g. And this matrix over here is just the inner product of all the vectors that come from the thing that you already know that are linearly independent. So that matrix is actually positive definite and therefore you can take its inverse. So the function that I have over here is a well-defined function. Uh, it's actually uh, non-negative and it takes only value between zero and one because of a normalization of G that I give. And uh, you can prove that the function is, uh, is uniformly continuous and it goes to zero at infinity. So what that gives you, it gives you that uh, this become uh, checking that the HRT conjecture is true for this new point A and B just become a local problem in the sense that because the function goes to zero at infinity, I can just sort of reduce my search to a big ball uh, around the origin. And that's what this statement sort of uh, tells you over here. So it's not too complicated to prove this, uh, this uh, result about this function. There are other interesting facts about the function. I'm not going to go into it and uh, I will not talk any more about it. Just to give you like uh, an example of what a function look like if I take a Gaussian for which I know that the HRT is true. And uh, I'm taking the Gaussian with only three points here. And what I'm saying is that the function achieve exactly its maximum value exactly at the two points at which I already know the HRT conjecture is true. Everywhere else, the value of this function will be set to less than one. And that's exactly what this is, this is showing. So what I think I would like to end with is uh, to combine this, uh, this approach to some of the results by uh, Demeter to prove the HRT conjecture for some special case of four points. Uh, but not only that, but when I made the, the uh, when I made the, the reduction that the function is real value. So before I do it, uh, before I sort of show you exactly what the result is saying, Let's go back to a set of arbitrarily four points and let's play the game that I played a little bit earlier. So uh, the points are going to be one is here. I pick one here, so that one. Um, I pick A, so that's A. And then I pick my four point to be anywhere. Or oh, let's, let's call this point S for instance. Let's not call it, let's call it S. And pick the four point to be anything you want to. So the coordinate of this point are going to be A, B. And suppose that uh, we play the game again and assume that G is a function from a real value function in L2. So G in L2 of R. So if I write exactly the relationship that I wrote a minute ago, that the linear combination G translated by S will be, uh, if it was linearly dependent, it will be a linear combination of all the other points. If I take a complex conjugate, what's going to happen is I need to reflect this about the x-axis is going to become a minus b. And then I'm going to reflect this point about the x-axis is going to be minus one. So now I have a special set of five points where the five points are going to look like uh, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, zero, a, b, and a minus b. So if I'm looking at uh, a minus b, so if I'm looking at real value function and I want to decide an arbitrary set of uh, four points is linearly independent, then if I can sort of uh, say anything about this particular set of five points, 
which is in position, if you think about it, there are three points on one line and two of the points are on a parallel line. So this is a very special case of a 3-2 configuration. If I can say something about this specific 3-2 uh, configuration, then I should be able to resolve the problem for, for this set of four points if the function is real value. And that's what this proposition is. It's actually a corollary of a next result that I'm going to state and maybe sort of highlight a little bit the proof of. Uh, it says that uh, if you give me any real value function and you assume that I have four point uh, distant point uh, under this condition about the point A and B, um, whether or not they are rational, irrational, their product is rational or irrational, uh, under those conditions, um, uh, the HRT conjecture is true. And uh, in fact, if in addition to assuming that the function is real value, if I assume that the function is also a Schwartz function, then in fact, I can prove that the HRT conjecture is true for any set of four points. But here, I want you to sort of make sure that you see that I made a lot of restriction. I'm assuming that the function is real value. This is a very big restriction that I don't know how to remove right now. But this result is uh, just a very simple corollary of something a little bit more technical and uh, a lot more interesting, which says that if you give me this set of, uh, this special, uh, set of uh, three, two configuration. So the point are going to be zero, 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 one, zero, negative one, A, B, and A minus B, uh, with B not equal to zero. Then I can prove the HRT conjecture here, uh, observe that I'm not making any assumption about whether or not G is a real value function. This is any arbitrary L2 function. So I can prove the HRT conjecture if A and B are rational number, this is actually easy. So this is not too difficult to prove. Uh, then if A is rational or B is irrational, that's already like a little bit tricky. And then the other two cases are actually sort of uh, a lot more tricky to sort of prove. And uh, I can prove that. Uh, so I actually like to present this in the following manner. So if you suppose that A is here and B is here, so rational and then irrational, rational and irrational, then uh, when A and B are both rational, so I know I can prove the HRT conjecture. When A is rational and B is irrational, I can uh, prove it. So B, A is rational and B is irrational. I can prove it as well. Uh, and then when both are irrational, so when both are irrational, I have two cases. When the product AB is rational, then I can prove it. And over here, I don't know. And here, I don't know what happened. So, uh, it's a little bit surprising. I think uh, I think this case should sort of be settled. I have not been able to sort of do it, but I believe it's probably just a matter of technicality because it's almost like a, somehow like a symmetric uh, to, to the other case that over here. But uh, this case right here, it's a lot more difficult. And that's the one that I think it's probably like uh, the most uh, um, difficult to settle in order to sort of uh, arrive at this result for this specific family of uh, symmetric three two configuration. So I'm not going to go into the proof, but the proof is actually uh, a modification and an extension of uh, an argument that uh, uh, was first proposed by Demeter. And uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, all the proof that I know relies somehow on understanding like uh, the iteration of a function toward plus infinity and minus infinity. When I only have three points, there is essentially one frequency that I have to deal with. That was the number A that I showed earlier. But when you have like more than two points, as in this case, then you have two things that you have to deal with. You can think about it as two frequencies that you have to deal with. You have to deal with the frequency one, but you also have to deal with the frequency B. And uh, it's uh, a little bit more tricky to actually sort of uh, play uh, the iteration game in this case. And Demeter um, uh, sort of introduced a very interesting argument called uh, like the conjugate trick argument. And uh, by combining this argument with the ergotic theorem, you can actually sort of uh, extend this result and uh, prove that for all the cases that I sort of uh, outlined here, the HRT conjecture can be proved. So uh, I want you to see where we started. The starting point is I have four points and I move to five points. So I'm trying to extend the HRT for one extra point. I have three points on the same line, the IQ space. I pick one over point outside the line and then I take exactly its symmetric version and I would like to extend the HRT. 
So that's a, some sort of extension that I'm trying to do. I'm trying to prove the HRT conjecture by adding one point at the time. Um, I believe uh, once we'll be able to close pretty much all the case and the only one that I'm not sort of sure how to sort of deal with is uh, when the product of A and B is, uh, is, uh, is uh, irrational. I might have sort of flipped the, the, the thing that I said, but uh, those are the case that I'm sort of not sure how to, how to deal with. Now, uh, before I end, I want to go back to the example that I, uh, I showed you earlier. Uh, the for example, of a three example. And uh, you can sort of see that this case is a one three configuration. And that one, if a function is a Schwarz function, then it was known by uh, from Demeter. But uh, since we know that the HRT holds for all one three configuration, except for maybe like uh, a set of zero measure, uh, this we cannot say anything. But when the function is real value, I know that this is also true. So this is a one, an example of a one three configuration. Uh, this one is uh, no longer a one-three configuration, but you can use the fact that uh, the number A and the number B that appear here are both uh, irrational, but the product is a rational number. And that's one of the case that was covered by the theorem that I, I uh, put up uh, a little bit earlier. But in general, this is not known, but if a function is real value, then uh, we can sort of settle the the, the HRT condi uh, conjecture for this particular set of four functions. Now, this last one, uh, this is a case where both A and B are irrational, but then the product is also irrational. And this case, it's a case that I have no idea what to sort of say. Even though I believe that the HRT conjecture is true for all set of four points, uh, sorry, all, uh, all four points in R2, uh, I'm not sure how to sort of uh, get the proof of this particular statement. So that's, uh, that's uh, what I was uh, hoping to sort of uh, present. Uh, there are some very interesting uh, literature if you want to sort of uh, read a little bit ab about it. There is a very nice review article by Chris Hyde that sort of uh, give essential the history of the HRT conjecture. Uh, and then recently they update the Hyde and uh, Spiegel updated that, uh, that uh, uh, history of the HRT. And uh, the, the, this one is a lot more recent and has more new results. And uh, most of the results that I mentioned today uh, in a paper that appeared earlier, um, I think late last year, or yes, late last year in the Journal of Free Analysis and Application. And uh, the paper by uh, Cyprian Dimitri are very interesting. And uh, I believe the technique that he introduced um, uh, I don't think we've uh, been able to push them to their limit. Uh, I think this is uh, a way to do it, this particular one that I show you, but I think there's still a lot of potential that one can sort of uh, take out of that. With that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, take any question you might have. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? I have a question. Um, yes, please. So the conjecture is to find for which sets lambda, the, they are linearly independent, am I right? In fact, the conjecture seems to be saying that for every finite set, it should be linearly independent. But uh, if I take uh, B case to be two, four, six, then two pi i times B k will be the same, right? Say it again. If I take B case to be two, four, six, even integers, then two e to the two pi i times B k will be the same, right? Yes. So it means that the if I A case to be fixed, let's fix them, and B case choose different, but inter, even integers, then uh, this modulation doesn't change anything, right? Ah, the, okay, okay. And then it's going to change. It's, going, it's not going to be the same. It's, uh, it's yes, a it will change. There is X. Okay, yes, okay. Yes, there is X. Yes. And then one more question. What What is known about function e to the negative absolute value of X? Um, is not is not settled. So that one is not settled. Uh, okay. And uh, I think that's one of the limits uh, uh, these people are were trying to actually reach. Uh, I think if you, 
there are special cases for a uh, set of points for which is known, but not in general. And that's what, uh, let's see. That's what these people were actually trying to get, uh, this right here. So that, that their goal was to sort of look at things that decay exponentially. And uh, this is the best they've got. And uh, when you sort of start adding some extra condition, to the set of point, then you can do it for for e to the power minus absolute value of n. Okay, thank you, Kasso. Great talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, then let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, Kasso, for your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and hopefully I'll see everybody again next week. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.